Father, we are grateful that you're good and that you're good all the time. And we pray that we would learn to appreciate your goodness, Lord, even when we don't understand what's going on in the moment. Uh, help us, because of who you are and your character and your loving plan for us, help us always acknowledge that, that you are good. Father, we've walked in this morning with all kind of distractions and uh, concerns, and we just, we just pray that the Spirit of God would quiet our hearts. Uh, help us hear your voice through your word, bring forth the Christ's honoring response. We give you thanks for it in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. As we continue our walk through the, the book of Acts this morning, we've entitled our message, Different Perspectives on Dangerous Decisions. The, the picture that you see is from uh, one of the scenarios in the, in the region that Paul was, was traveling through. Those waters looked very peaceful, but there were a lot of times he was traveling, he had everything but peace. When you think of the unrest that's taking place in our nation from recent decisions by our Supreme Court on abortion and, and gun laws, and you notice the passionate opposite reactions from the American people. We are indeed a divided states of America, and it's, as you look at our landscape, it's not hard to understand why I am convicted uh, that in the end times events, America will not be a prime time player. Most great nations eroded from the inside, not from being conquered from the outside. And I think you see that taking place in our country. Some of these decisions are potentially saving lives, or others saw from the same decisions that their lives were not being valued. But when decisions are not viewed from a biblical perspective, a Christ-centered perspective, it's going to boil down to personal preferences and flawed logic determining how we respond. Beloved, we need a biblical worldview on everything that is taking place. Background for Acts chapter 21. Paul has said goodbye to his friends in Ephesus and the team is continuing on towards Jerusalem. You can't see the names on the map, but uh, to my left, that's the region they were departing from. And, and as you read those early verses, it looks like they're making a couple little what I call bus stops along the way. And Paul basically says, you know what, we need to catch the express. And so, so they're going to take another ship, they're going to go past Cyprus, that island in the middle, and at the bottom of that map, they're going to wind up in Tyre. Got it? Yeah. All right. It's been about 20 years since Paul was involved in the stoning of Stephen prior to his conversion. And in spite of many hardships, he is still determined to share Christ with whomever will listen. Follow me in the word of God, Acts chapter 21. Now it came to pass that when we had departed from them and set sail, running a straight course, we came to Kos, following day to Rhodes, and from there to Batara. That would be the, the starting point on, on that map. But here's where I said he decided to catch the express, verse 2. And finding a ship sailing over to Phoenicia, we went aboard and set sail. When we had sighted Cyprus... We passed it on the left, sailed to Syria, landed at Tyre. For there the ship was to unload her cargo. And finding disciples, we stayed there seven days. They told Paul, through the Spirit, not to go up to Jerusalem. When we had come to the end of those days, we departed and went on our way. And they all accompanied us with wives and children till we were out of the city and we knelt down on the shore and prayed. And when we had taken our leave of one another, we boarded the ship and they returned home. When we'd finished our voyage from Tyre, we came to Ptolemyus, greeted the brothers, stayed with them one day. Next day, we who were Paul's companions departed and came to Caesarea and entered the house of Philip the Evangelist, who was one of the seven, and stayed with him. Let me pause there for a moment, look at your outline letter A. As Paul begins what's going to be his final trip to Jerusalem initially, he's made many stops at small yet significant cities. You saw a city named Kos, I believe that's where Hippocrates was for a while. The team found a ship that would make fewer stops and found a few disciples to minister to 
at Tyre. It's interesting where it says there he found disciples. He went looking. They were going to be there a week. He went looking for disciples that he could minister to since he was going to be there a week. See, some believers find disciples wherever they travel. Others are just sightseeing. What do you see when you're not at home? Paul said, I got a week here. I'm going to find some disciples that I can pour into. Okay? Moving on. Notice that the text says, Acts chapter 21, verse 8, The next day we who were Paul's companions departed, came to Caesarea. That's Luke in that statement about we. They entered the house of Philip the Evangelist, who was one of the seven, and stayed with him. Now please don't read over that too fast. Remember the seven from Acts chapter 6? Philip was one of those seven. We typically call them the first deacons that were set aside. Stephen was also one of the seven. You may recall that when Stephen was stoned to death, it was Paul, basically the ringleader of the hit squad. Well, Stephen was stoned. Whose house did he just go to? Philip, Stephen's boy. Okay? Paul and Philip spend time together at Caesarea. That's another evidence of the reconciling power and grace of God and changed lives. Yes. See, 20 years earlier, it was Paul leading the execution party of Stephen, the friend, the co-worker of Philip. Here they are fellowshipping as brothers in Christ. How would you have handled such a situation? You see what the amazing grace of God can do? Hey, brother, we were enemies 20 years ago. You led the rock party that got my boy killed, but you found the same saving grace that I have, and so now me, you, and Stephen are going to be brothers forever in glory. Let's do the work. You got to be strong in the Lord to handle that. Okay? They're fellowshipping with one another. Okay? I could park there, but I got to keep moving. Verse 9. Philip, this man had four virgin unmarried daughters who prophesied. Let me make a point here. Let us see. Philip's daughters were proclaiming the word of God. See, let's not confuse being gifted for ministry and using our gifts with being qualified to hold certain positions in the local church. God in his sovereignty has chosen men for certain roles even though women are equally gifted. Remember I've said before, a difference between preaching and pastoring. A difference between proclaiming the word of God and being an elder. When you go to 1 Timothy 3, he's designating males, men, for certain offices. You use your gifts, it doesn't mean you have the certain same position. And you say, well, why did, I, why did God do that? Well, he, he said he formed Adam first. He could have made him at the same time. His point was he wanted the husband to be the leader, to be the point man, to be responsible. And he gave the wife to be the perfect complement perfectly equal, same Holy Spirit, same gifts. And so when your children say, well, well, why does dad have this assignment and mom have this assignment? Because we didn't make ourselves. There's a God who decided that this is how he wanted it done. So we work together to complement one another, not compete with one another. Okay? They proclaim the word. They didn't have the office of elder or church leader. You got it? Okay. I could park there for a few days, but we won't. Okay. <laughs> Verse 10. As we stayed many days, a certain prophet named Agabus came down from Judea. When he had come to us, he took Paul's belt, bound his own hands and feet, and said, Thus says the Holy Spirit, So shall the Jews at Jerusalem bind the man who owns this belt and deliver him into the hands 
of the Gentiles. Now when we heard these things, both we and those from that place pleaded with him not to go up to Jerusalem. Agabus, prophet, other concerned believers, and Luke's one of them, they start to beg Paul and warn Paul, don't go to Jerusalem. There's danger ahead. I titled the message, Different Perspectives on Dangerous Situations. They're speaking by the Holy Spirit, right? Did you catch that? They're not coming up with the The Holy Spirit is showing them, Paul, there's danger in Jerusalem. Their conclusion is, don't go there. Turn back to chapter 20. We covered this last week. Watch this. Acts chapter 20. Shouldn't take you a whole lot of time to go from chapter 21 to chapter 20. Okay? <laughs> <laughs> Acts chapter 20 starting at verse 22 this is Paul speaking watch this and see now I go bound in the spirit to Jerusalem not knowing the things that will happen to me there except that the Holy Spirit testifies in every city saying that chains and tribulations await me but none of these things move me, nor do I count my life dear to myself, so that I may finish my race with joy and the ministry which I receive from the Lord Jesus to testify to the gospel of the grace of God. Go back to 21. Did you see that? These men who love Paul are saying the Holy Spirit's telling us there's danger ahead. Don't go. Paul is saying, he's already told me there's danger ahead, but I got to go. I got a calling. I got a ministry. I have to face the danger because the Lord has called me to do this. Different perspective on the same situation. Isn't it interesting that our Lord Jesus had that same perspective? As he's going to Jerusalem and his boys are with him and John 11, he's, he's going to raise Lazarus and they say, Master, you don't want to go there. Remember last time there they were, they were trying to stone you. You don't want to go there, do you? He said, basically, I got to go. And they said, well, let's go die with them. His face was set like a flint to go to Jerusalem. He had business there in the midst of danger. And Paul is the same way. He said, I know it's dangerous, but God told me to go there. We have good friends, as we move on, good people with good intentions, but sometimes they may give bad advice. Okay? Acts 21, verse 13. Paul answers them and says, What do you mean by weeping? And breaking my heart. The word means you're, you're pounding on my heart like you want to break it. I know you love me. I understand there's danger, but God has called me to go into it anyway. I'm ready not only to be bound, but also to die at Jerusalem for the name of the Lord Jesus. Isn't that stirring and powerful to know that you can face dangerous decisions if God has called you into them. You need to know that. There were other times when they would avoid the danger. But this time Paul knew that God had called him to go into it. And so he goes. And so his boys say in verse 14, So when he would not be persuaded, we cease saying the will of the Lord be done. You can look at those other verses when you have opportunity. Acts chapter 21, starting at verse 15, the Word of God says, After those days we packed and went up to Jerusalem. Also some of the disciples from Caesarea went with us, brought with them a certain Manasseh of Cyprus, an early disciple with whom we were to lodge. When we had come to Jerusalem, the brothers received us gladly. On the following day, Paul went in with us to James. And all the elders 
were present. Remember from Acts 15, James is the Lord's brother, the acknowledged leader of the church in Jerusalem. He greets them, verse 19. He tells in detail those things which God had done among the Gentiles through his ministry. When they heard it, they glorified the Lord. They said to him, you see, brother, how many myriads of Jews, how many thousands of Jews there are who have believed. And they're all zealous for the law. They've been informed about you that you teach all the Jews who are among the Gentiles to forsake Moses, saying they ought not to circumcise their children nor to walk according to the customs. Now, the rumor mill did not just start. Okay, Did you see this? Paul, good to see you. There's thousands of believers in Jerusalem. They know you're coming. Oh, and by the way, Paul, the word is out that you've offended a lot of these Jews because what they've been hearing is that you're going around telling people, ignore the customs, ignore the law of Moses, ignore circumcision. There's a lot of Jews here, Paul, but you know what? Some are mad at you. So let me tell you what I think you ought to do. Okay, you with me? Verse 22. What then? The assembly must certainly meet, for they will hear that you have come. Therefore, do what we tell you. Let's, let's pause there. <laughs> Letter A, bottom of your hand up. Upon his arrival in Jerusalem, he's greeted joyfully by the believers. There's still a lot of Jews who are upset with him because of their misunderstandings and convictions about the law of Moses the importance of circumcision, and Jewish customs. So they're going to tell Paul how he can appease his critics. Let's move on. Verse 23. Therefore, do what we tell you. We have four men who have taken a vow. Take them. Be purified with them. Pay their expenses so that they may shave their heads and that all may know that those things of which they were informed concerning you are nothing, but that you yourself also walk orderly and keep the law. But concerning the Gentiles who believe, we've written and decided that they should observe no such thing, except that they should keep themselves from things offered to idols, from blood, from things strangled, from sexual immorality. We've covered these things in previous week. You can get those lessons if you like to. But So long story short, bottom of letter A on your handout, they're saying, Paul, why don't you go in with these brothers who've taken the Nazarite vow? You can read about that in Numbers chapter 6. Go through the ritual with them. Pay for all the animals that they have to offer as part of their sacrifice. Everybody will see that you, you haven't abandoned the customs and the culture, and they'll make the other conclusions, and all will be well. But actually, this action is going to create as many problems as it may have solved. See, good intentions do not always align with good advice. There's nothing sinful about what Paul's going to do. He's not compromising the gospel at all. He's doing exactly what they said to do in Acts chapter 15. But because the, the motive was, hey, we, we just got to appease these boys and, and let them know that you're still preaching everything that they've always heard, why don't you do this? And it sounds like a, a good idea. But things aren't going to go the way they hoped. Okay? Acts chapter 21, verse 26. Paul took them in. The next day, having been purified with them, entered the temple to announce the expiration of the days of purification, at which time an offering should be made for each one of them. So far, so good, right? Okay. Verse 27. Now, when the seven days were almost ended, the Jews from Asia, seeing him in the temple, stirred up the whole crowd and laid hands on him crying out, men of Israel, help! This is the man who teaches all men against, all men everywhere against the people, 
the law, and this place. And furthermore, he also brought Greeks into the temple and has defiled this holy place. For they had previously seen Trophimus, the Ephesian, with Paul in the city, whom they supposed, whom they supposed that Paul had brought into the temple. All the city was disturbed. The people ran together, seized Paul, dragged him out of the temple, and immediately the doors were shut. Now as they were seeking to kill him. Paul's right there. So he goes into the temple with the Jewish brethren. They fulfill the rituals. It looks like all is going well. And then the Jews from Asia come in assuming that he's brought some Greeks into the holy place. He's defiled the temple. Did you notice they dragged him out of the temple and about to beat him to death? You see what religion will do when you don't have a relationship with God? <clears throat> Back your hand up. While in the temple with the men who had fulfilled their vows, Jews from Asia accused Paul of having defiled the temple by bringing Greeks, and Greeks into the forbidden areas. The entire city's in uproar. Paul is dragged outside and would have been beaten to death had not the commander and the soldiers intervened. As prophesied, Paul had walked into danger and is about to walk into imprisonment. Did he make the right choice? Did he receive good advice? See, some folks will say, well, I must be out of God's will. I'm having hard times. <clears throat> and yet he's in God's will because God told him to go to Jerusalem, and God told him he's going to have some hard times. Okay? Acts 21, verse 31. As they were seeking to kill him, why are they going to kill him? He took... How dare he take Greeks into the holy place? That's worthy of death. Mm, mm, mm. News came to the commander of the garrison that all Jerusalem was in an uproar. He immediately took soldiers and centurions and ran down to them. When they saw the commander and the soldiers, they stopped beating Paul. Do you remember the Romans did not like the Jews having this kind of civil unrest? and especially taking the lives of the people they wanted to be enslaved to them. So the peacekeepers come down, and thankfully at this point, they happen to save Paul's life. <clears throat> Are you with me? Okay. Verse 33, the commander came near, took him, commanded him to be bound with two chains, and he asked who he was and what he had done. I'm so tempted to say folk get arrested before they ask what you've done, but I'm going to leave that alone. <clears throat> okay? <clears throat> so they're beating Paul. <clears throat> they come to Paul. They arrest Paul and say, okay, what have you done? Okay? <clears throat> Section 3. <clears throat> being in God's will may lead to various forms of persecution, but the privileges of being chosen by God will outweigh everything else. What have you done? Why are folks ready to beat you to death? Verse 34, Acts chapter 21. Some among the multitude cried one thing, and some another. So when he could not ascertain the truth because of the tumult, he commanded him to be taken to the barracks. Everybody's shouting out he did this, he did that. The captain can't figure out what the real charge is. Let's take him to the barracks. When he reached the stairs, verse 35, he had to be carried by the soldiers because of the violence of the mob. For the multitude of the people followed after, crying out, away with him, kill him. Then as Paul was about to be led into the barracks, he said to the commander, May I speak to you? He said, Can you speak Greek? Aren't you the Egyptian who some time ago stirred up a rebellion 
and led 4,000 assassins out into the wilderness? Letter A, section 3. As he's about to be imprisoned, Paul asked the commander for an opportunity to speak with him. The commander was shocked that Paul could speak Greek. He mistook Paul for an Egyptian insurrectionist. First of all, does that change your perspective about how Paul might have looked? Just something to think about. It was A.D. 54. There was a false prophet who attracted thousands of Jewish followers to the Mount of Olives. He told them that he was going to command the walls of Jerusalem to come down, just like it happened to Jericho. And those walls are going to come down, and we're going to go in there, and we're going to overthrow these Romans. And the Romans looked out and said, that ain't happening. And they came out, and they killed some of the Jews. And so this commander, he's putting two, to, two together. He said, this dude must be that false prophet who got some of the Jewish people killed, and now they're ready to kill him. Isn't that amazing? Paul says in verse 39, I'm, I'm a Jew. I'm not that Egyptian insurrectionist. I'm a Jew from Tarsus, Cilicia, a great city. I implore you, let me speak to the people. So when he had given him permission, Paul stood on the stairs and motioned with his hand to the people. And when there was a great silence, he spoke to them, not in Greek, but in Hebrew. Paul was a brilliant dude. You know? they, they tell us he was so brilliant, we would have heard about him even if he had never gotten saved. He, he had that kind of reputation amongst people. But now by the grace of God, he has silenced the crowd. And they're about to let him speak. And he says, chapter 22, Brethren, fathers, hear my defense before you now. And when they heard that he spoke to them in the Hebrew language, they kept all the more silent. And then he said, I'm indeed a Jew, born in Tarsus of Cilicia, brought up in the city at the feet of Gamaliel, Taught according to the strictness of our father's law, I was zealous towards God as you all are today. I persecuted this way to the death, binding and delivering into prison both men and women, and also the high priest bears me witness in all the council of the elders, from whom I also received letters to the brethren and went to Damascus to bring in chains even those who were there in Jerusalem. I was going to bring them to Jerusalem to be punished. Paul is going to start sharing his testimony again, letter B. About how he met the risen Lord Jesus Christ on his way to Damascus to persecute the saints. You've heard this before. He's sharing his testimony here now. He's going to share it again before the book of Acts is over. That is why it is so important that you're ready to share your testimony not to brag about what you used to do wrong, but to tell people how Jesus Christ rescued you. Be ready to share your testimony. Paul is starting to share his testimony to, to people who are ready to kill him. And he tells them, Acts 22, verse 6, Now it happened as I journeyed and came near Damascus at about noon, suddenly a great light from heaven shone around me, I fell to the ground. I heard a voice saying to me, Saul, Saul, why are you persecuting me? So I answered, Who are you, Lord? He said to me, I am Jesus of Nazareth, whom you are persecuting. And those who were with me indeed saw the light and were afraid. They did not hear the voice of him who spoke to me. Let it be still. Take note again of how Christ identifies with his children. He takes it personally. When somebody attacks one of his children, he said, you didn't just attack them. You're persecuting me. <clears throat> so Paul realizes <clears throat> someone from heaven speaking to him. He 
He's not sure yet if it's an angel or if it's the Lord. And so he asks the question, who are you, sir? Then he hears the voice of someone he thought was dead and buried. He said, I am Jesus whom you are persecuting. And immediately he's convicted and he does something that some of you have not done yet. He surrendered and said, Lord, what do you want me to do? Some of us go to church our whole life and never ever ask, make that surrender. And until you do, you will never find out what God put you on planet earth to do. Lord. And then calling him Lord, that means you are willing to obey anything and everything he tells you to do. Lord, what will you have me to do? If you've never asked that question, if you've never made that confession, make sure you do it. Don't waste your life. Trying to do things God did not create you to do. He loved you too much to let you be fulfilled staying out of his will. What shall I do, Lord? The Lord said to me, verse 10, Arise, go into Damascus, and there you will be told all things which are appointed for you to do. And some of y'all would have said, Why can't you just tell me right here? <laughs> Obey what the Lord tells you to do. Lord, you just blinded me. How am I going to get to Damascus? Well, that's what you're on your way to. I'll get you there. But now somebody had to help him. Because he got blinded by that light. He says that in verse 11. Since I could not see for the glory of that light, being led by the hand of those who were with me, I came into Damascus. Then a certain Ananias, a devout man according to the law, having a good testimony with all the Jews who lived there, came to me, and he stood and said to me, and I emphasized this before, but I'll say it again, this was the man who was persecuting the church. What are the words he hears from Ananias, who not long before he would have been on a mission to destroy, Ananias comes to him and says, Brother Saul, wow. <laughs> received your sight yes. at the same hour I looked up at him I'm going to close with this I'm going to park here for a minute look at letter C Paul <clears throat> go to Damascus you'll find out what I want you to do he's gone through some difficult times but the difficult times that come with being a follower of Christ don't outweigh the privileges that he gives us. Watch what Ananias tells him because the same principles apply to each and every one of us. Acts 22, verse 14. Ananias says to him, the Spirit of God is also saying to you and to me today, the God of our fathers has chosen you <coughs> and you should know his will. See the just one. <clears throat> Hear the voice of his mouth. Beloved, we have been chosen to receive sight. Well, many others in this world remain spiritually blind. Do you realize we see what's going on and this world doesn't? Why? Because the God of our fathers has chosen us and allowed us to see the spiritual realities that this world is blind to. What a privilege we have. Chosen. Not just to see, but let it be to, to know his will. We've been chosen to, to know him <clears throat> and to know his will for us. That's a privilege. That's a privilege to know who God is and know why he created you and know what he wants you to do with your life so that you can be fulfilled and satisfied and fruitful and make a difference not just now but forever. And people in this world don't know that. 
They're making money and they're not fulfilled. They're blowing through relationships and blaming the other person. They don't know the Lord. They don't know his will for their life. And they're blaming everybody else. What a privilege we have. We can see the invisible realities. We, we know him and we know his will. And he also says we get to see the just one. The righteous one. The holy one. The Lord Jesus Christ. We have been given the privilege of seeing and knowing who Jesus Christ is. There are a lot of people out there using his name. They don't know him. They say good things about him, but they don't say he's the son of God. They don't say he's God incarnate. They don't say he's the Lord. They talk about a Jesus they, they've made up. We know who he is. What a privilege. We get to hear the voice of his mouth. Number four there, we can recognize our shepherd's voice when others are confused. Jesus said, my sheep hear my voice and they know me. They'll follow me. They're not going to be confused by a false shepherd's voice. <clears throat> Beloved, there's a thousand voices crying out at you. <clears throat> Do you know your shepherd's voice? Back in the day when we were out there on the street and dad called and mom called, <coughs> and you knew that voice <coughs> and you knew you better reply to it. <coughs> you could pick that voice out in the crowd when you were messing up. You better know your parents' voice. We know his voice and we know how he speaks to us. What a privilege to be one of his sheep yes. and to hear his voice. He goes on to say, verse 15, you will be his witnesses to all men of what you have seen and heard. We get to be his witnesses. We get to tell others what we've seen, what we've heard. You, you can't be a witness if you haven't seen and heard what you're talking about. We've got a world full of false witnesses talking about something they heard secondhand and, and thirdhand. You can't go up on the court stand and be a witness and you didn't see anything, you didn't hear anything. Well, I heard Johnny told Joe that Susie said, that, you're not a witness. <laughs> we are his witnesses because we have seen and heard with the spiritual sight that he's given us. And we know who he is, and we know his voice. And Paul said it was decision time. And Ananias told him in verse 16, what you waiting on? Get up. Get baptized. Have your sins washed away as you call on the name of the Lord. Those who call upon Jesus Christ as Lord and Savior will have their sins washed away as they do so. He's not saying the baptism washes away your sin. You should know better than that by now. But as you call upon his name, who he is, all that he's done, all that he stands for, as you call upon him and acknowledge that he is Lord, he, he saves you and he empowers you and he delivers you. And Ananias told Paul, what you waiting on? Let's get on with this. As you sit here in Hope Alliance this morning, what are you waiting on? This isn't the first time you've heard this. Why have you not yet surrendered? Why have you not yet obeyed? The gospel message will be the same next week and next year if he lets you live to hear it. The moment you hear his voice, don't harden your heart. Do what he says. We'll pause there. We'll pick up the rest next week. I close with this. Those who call upon Jesus Christ, recognizing who he is, what he has done, and that he has a name that is above every name. That name is Lord. Those who do that will have their sins washed away as they do so. If you've not done so, will you do so today? You'll receive a different perspective on everything that you face in this life. And the Lord, the God of glory, will be with you forever. What a privilege. God bless you.